Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Emlois Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. Thank you, and thanks for, for everyone for coming on this Saturday morning. I'm out of the cold, um, but at least it's sunny. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, a whole bunch of things. This is kind of the hook, just to get you in the room. Um, <laughs> but this is actually what I'm going to talk about. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the energy challenge that we're all facing today. and. There's an awful lot of misunderstanding about the economics and the reasons why we, have, why we make the energy choices we make. So I want to sort of set up the, the, the argument from that perspective. And then I'm going to actually tell you about how we've uh, solar powered our house. We have a second home up in Vermont, which is off the electricity grid. So it's serious. It's, you know, if we don't have... Uh, if the sun doesn't come out, things don't work as well as they should. Um, and it's homemade, so it's really a grassroots uh, system. But then I'm going to talk about even the most important thing. It's not so much power generation, but power conservation. Deal with the room lights first. And then just a few things to close. So that's where I'm going today. <coughs> um, these are, according to... Richard Smalley, who won the Nobel Prize uh, for Physics uh, back in the 1990s. Um, it's a nice thing when you get a Nobel Prize, people actually start to listen to you. You don't necessarily say anything more profound than you did beforehand. But <laughs> he wrote a list that everybody uses, humanity's top 10 problems. And energy is right at the top, because from energy flows almost every other challenge that we have. Um, if you want water, which is a huge problem, uh, desalinization, uh, it's part of the energy uh, budget because we have hydropower and so on. And then you just go on down. I, I love the one, number nine, humanity's top ten problems. One of them happens to be democracy. Um, we kind of see that uh, as we go toward November. Um, <laughs> just to keep in mind what uh, Richard Smalley did to get his Nobel Prize is he identified this very interesting molecule called C60. Um, it has 60 carbon atoms. It's very important in the world of energy, as I'll talk about uh, later. Um, but you can see uh, he, was, he was confronted with this puzzle of how do you, they knew that they had a molecule that only had 60 carbon atoms and he had to put it together in his mind and it came out looking like a soccer ball. So this is called soccer ballium. <laughs> it's called Buckminster fullerene. So it's one of the fullerenes and so on. But it's a, it's a beautiful piece of, of work. So now let me talk a little bit about energy, how we use it and where we get it from. But first I'll start, there's a, um, uh, I think he's in the geology department here, Mark Newman, who does maps. Really were, uh, the, the maps were to predict um, red and blue regions of the United States during elections. But then he uh, generalized this to look at any sort of demographic fact about the world. And so what he's done here is he's, he's created a map where each of the country's sizes <coughs> is scaled to the population. And you can see the United States with about 300 million is what? That's about a 20th of the world's population, something like that. China, of course, and India are very big. So I want you to capture this picture in your head. Take a snapshot, because I'm going to show you another map. This is energy consumption around the world. OK, and you can see uh, the US is a little bit supersized. Um, Russia looks like a piece of spandex <laughs> across the top of the, uh, the uh, Asian and European continents. And, and again, you can see that the developed world, the countries are very large, Europe, Japan, and so on. Japan, uh, China, of course, is, is expanding. So this is, you could think of this as a balloon. Um, 
and it gives you a sense of if you take the previous map and divide it by this one, that our per capita um, use of energy is huge compared to the rest of the world. And when I say we, I'm talking about the developed world, but the United States is certainly at the top. So it's pretty much clear that the currency of the world is not the euro or the dollar, but it's the jewel, the unit of energy. The, the more energy you use up to a point, the higher your standard of living, and then you become wasteful. So if you go, for example, to more energy conserving countries like the Scandinavian countries, they have a very high standard of living, but their use per capita is less. But by and large, there is a correlation between how, how is your health and well-being uh, compared to the amount of energy you use. And I, I just like to show this view graph. I've shown it on many occasions over, over the years. Um, two billion people, one third of the people on Earth do not have access to electricity. So that means that over the last 10,000 years, their lifestyle has not changed that much. They go out, they work the field, they come in, it's dark, they go to sleep. Um, it takes very, very little energy to turn that around. Why I really like this is this uh, Light Up the World Foundation um, supplies a little solar panel and some light emitting devices, uh, light emitting diodes for light, and what is the first thing that people do? Well, people are curious, so they start to read. And that cycle gets broken because they move up in the world um, and, and that very basic lifestyle uh, has finally uh, broken the chain. And it's important to note that these people are not completely without light. They basically use kerosene and other fossil fuels to give themselves light in the evening. And so there's widespread um, problems with emphysema and so on in the third world. So this is just one impact, a very small change you can make, costs almost nothing, and, and something happens. Now, let me talk a little bit about our basic energy demands and sources. So this shows that there's an awful lot of talk about peak oil and we're running out of oil and we're running out of fossil fuel. Don't believe a word of it. Um, we got tons of it. We got more than we can possibly make use of. You can see the re resource base. This is old data, by the way, because gas has gone through the roof. So these numbers for gas are completely wrong. Um, 2,000 years of coal is still in the ground, easily. Oil, we keep discovering it everywhere. We're getting better at getting oil out of more difficult environments, such as the Gulf of Mexico. Deep water ocean drilling has become common. We really don't know how much is there. We know there's an awful lot there. So we're not running out of fossil fuels. Forget about it. But as Nate Lewis says, <laughs> the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. <laughs> There's other drivers here that make us want to get away from fossil fuels. And it's kind of shown here. So on the right, the view graph shows the global carbon emissions from energy production. And we know that uh, carbon dioxide is a real problem in our atmosphere. <clears throat> Things are getting warmer every day. And you can see the amount of carbon, much of it is anthropogenic, that is, it's created by man, um, is creating sort of a hockey stick in the wrong direction. And if you go back and think um, about what the world's evolution has been like, this place started long, long ago as a hot little orb filled with all kinds of gases in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide was one. Life began, it started to uh, use carbon dioxide, it got buried, um, got under the ground, less and less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and for a whole bunch of other reasons, this planet cooled and became much more inviting to life and here we are today. And now we have all of that carbon dioxide which has been sequestered, put underground and we're now digging it up, putting it back in the air and it's getting warmer and warmer and uh, maybe we'll be a hot lifeless orb one day again, careening through space. Now if you um, look at the energy stocks, 
then the, the answer to the question of where do, where, how do we change this equation, it becomes pretty obvious. So those boxes give the relative size of the energy stocks. Um, so the black is coal. So the first three boxes are fossil fuels. Again, th this is probably more accurate because it's more recent. That's the total stock. And uranium, you see, is a very tiny little piece. And up in and the annual energy demand is the little purple box at the bottom. So we got tons of stuff. But look at the box for solar. And that's just every year. So um, another thing that Nate Lewis uh, has said, he's, he's really good at these things. He says um, he believes in, what is it, the, uh, the Willie Sutton uh, philosophy. Why do we go to so solar? Because that's where the energy is, of course. Willie Sutton was asked, um, um, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is. So solar is a big, is a huge uh, uh, source of energy. So then here's another, I, I love this quote um, from Thomas Edison, because it has such a 19th century ring to it. I put, this is long before the um, invention of the solar cell about 50 years before, I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait till oil and coal run out before we tackle that. It's interesting that at the turn of the um, 19th to the 20th century, actually even before that, it was, it was uh, in the mid uh, 19th century, um, a very famous, uh, I think it was a chemist, uh, Arrhenius, who's very well known for uh, talking about chemical reactions, uh, did a calculation. He was worried because in London they had the London fog, all the coal smoke going up. And he did a calculation that showed that the amount of carbon dioxide going into the air by about the year 2000 would start to acidify the oceans. That was before the automobile. And of course, that's happening now. So why don't we use solar energy? As a matter of fact, if you took six boxes of solar cells, these are um, you know, six solar fields, so 120 miles on a side, which is a pretty lot of, a lot of solar cells, um, that would give you about 3.3 terawatts each. That equals 20 terawatts, which is more than the uh, use of mankind today. And you can see you put them in the temperate zones, and you can supply everything you need for mankind's uh, um, energy demands, electricity energy demands. But the problem is it's expensive. There's no clear route to making solar a major supplier of energy today because of the cost. And that is, the cost is shown here. This shows coal, gas, wind, nuclear, solar. And um, you can see that solar is by far the highest. It's about 15 to 30 cents per kilowatt hour. I, you're probably paying in Michigan on our meters something like seven or eight cents per kilowatt hour today. So this is a very expensive um, bit of energy. And the other thing I'd like to point out is though 120 miles on a side seems great, especially if you put the solar field in the Dust Bowl, um, which is, of course, where we'd want to put it, right? Um, it, it's a lot of land area. Actually, this, that box is a little bigger than 120 miles on a side. But I, just to put it in perspective, I think I'll move it. <laughs> so we'd all be living under this shelter of, of, of solar panels. But we do have a lot of roadways. We have a lot of open space that we use for other purposes. And I'm not talking about open space that is Yosemite Valley or something. We, we have rooftops, uh, again, and roadways and so on. So it's, um, there are a lot of opportunities to cover vast distances with solar power. And you can even put um, solar power on your car. Right? You could, the paint could be um, uh, energy generating. Uh, and that, too, can act as a solar panel. Uh, creating some uh, energy source. So this then kind of puts it in perspective again. Renewable energy is only providing uh, about three quads of energy. The total uh, use in the world is 480 quads, and the U.S. 
is 93 quads. So you can see renewables are still a very, and that's all renewables. Uh, wind, um, I guess it's all but uh, biomass and hydro, which are considered renewable. So what is the cost looking like today? And then I'll move on to um, talking a little bit about the technology after this. So one of the good pieces of news is that solar energy is decreasing in cost very rapidly. Um, at, this is dollars per watt in the vertical axis. A dollar per watt is approximately co co uh, fossil fuel parity. Now this is the cost of the panel itself. Unfortunately, the cost of the panel is only a piece of the cost of solar energy. But you can see it's really coming down. There was a flattening in 2006 to 2009. Um, silicon became a little bit more precious as a commodity, purified silicon. But then all of a sudden we had companies like Dow and, and uh, other companies around the world that started to produce it rather cheaply and it really has dropped. And of course there's the Chinese factor um, of uh, putting very low cost solar panels on the market, so there's probably a little bit of illusion to the price we're at today. But then there's the, and we can talk about that perhaps later, um, but there's this other price piece, which is the um, square boxes, which is called the balance of systems. So you have a panel, then you gotta put a panel on a stand, you gotta turn the DC to AC and get it up to some voltage that you can transmit down the wires and so on. And that at least is as expensive as the panel itself. So the sum of those two is the upper um, orange bubbles. And you can see we're, we're about two to three, maybe even four times more expensive than fossil fuel today. The only way that comes down today and why these things get installed is because of government supports. And we can talk about government supports because of course oil also has government supports. But you know you you have to play with the with the deck of cards you're dealt with, and there's an expectation that this will com, uh, compete uh, dollar for dollar with any other source of alternative energy. So now let me talk about the actual technology itself. I've tried to uh, keep a whole lot of details out because this is a this is a great field of study. In fact, it's what my uh, my own laboratory, my graduate students work on, on a daily basis. But basically what happens is uh, the sun comes up, you have a silicon solar cell. This is the biggest market today. It's a, it's a fraction of a millimeter thick. It's put into some sort of plastic panel that you, you see a module, a module. I'll show you some pictures, but you've seen them uh, all out there as you drive on the freeway and so on. It creates uh, the photons. Uh, the optical energy comes in and it creates a free charge within the material. That free charge is then swept to the two contacts so it acts just like a battery and um, hopefully you can put it into a load and you get light or something else out of it. But that's very simple property. It, it uses semiconductors, the same stuff that is in your laptop computer and so on. So how good can we do with this? But it, they also, by the way, power cell phones. Um, <laughs> the, um, these are just some facts. On a sunny day in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere in the more or less temperate zones, we get one kilowatt per square meter uh, of solar power. So that's a lot of power. How many square meters are even on this roof here? So a, a meter is a yard, right? So this is probably a few hundred square meters, this is a few hundred kilowatts right here, hitting this roof if it were exposed to the sun. Um, power conversion efficiency of a solar cell is measured in percent, so it's really how many watts of electrical power do you get per watt of solar power that's, impact, that's impinging on it. That's watt per watt, or percent. So if you go to the theoretical limit of efficiency for a single junction solar cell, um, it's called the shockley quasar limit. It is 31%. Thermodynamics nails you to that number. So you can get out of one square meter of silicon, you can get 31% of, you can get 310 watts of power. You can fool the shockley quasar limit by making um, different types of cells. You can get up to 42%, which is pretty good. 
the best silicon solar cells out there today, actually you can't buy these things, they're more laboratory, is around 24%. Silicon cell, when installed, is about 16%. So if you have a square meter, you can get, when the sun's up, about 160 watts. Well, these are what they look like. Um, you've seen them all around. Um, the ones here, um, let's see if I can, oh, I know how I have to do this. So these are silicon solar cells. Uh, this is kind of weird, okay. Um, that's probably about a kilowatt of power it could generate. It's, it's actually pretty cheap. You can put them on your houses today and get some money back in the, by putting them into the, um, uh, into the grid. And then there's gallium arsenide, which is this, some of the stuff we work on. It's even more efficient, but you can see it's, uh, it's pretty small in this case because that came out of our laboratory. But you can put it on foils, you can roll it up, um, but it's, it's quite expensive still. What we work on in my laboratory, in addition to gallium arsenide, is to use plastic materials for uh, solar energy generation. And uh, these are organic materials, they're highly earth abundant, um, very low temperature processing. A organic material is basically some, is a molecule that is, um, has a lot of carbon in it. It's primarily a carbon-based material, but it will also have hydrogen and, and it has um, other molecules, uh, other atoms, for example, the monomer that I show on the left is, uh, the yellow thing is, is in that case, I think, platinum. Um, the whole size of this molecule, by the way, is only about uh, one nanometer from side to side. And I'll give you some scaling factors in a minute on that. But it's, um, they're really small. And if you, if you uh, attach them together, they form these long chains. And that is the plastics that we know. It's very durable, uh, flexible, lightweight. They also happen to be good semiconductors like silicon, not as good as silicon, but they're extremely cheap and uh, therefore uh, can perhaps be used for very low uh, solar power generation, low, low cost solar, solar power generation. The guy on the right is another form of organic molecule. <clears throat> it's a biological molecule, consists of millions of separate atoms, and of course it's the stuff that makes us all up. We know that organic molecules are like us, they die. Um, and that's a problem, because you need to have long-lived uh, pieces of, of equipment. Uh, just to give you very quickly um, why organic materials are interesting, because they're cheap, they're easy to process, very low temperature type of thing. They're compatible with these flexible substrates, so you can roll them onto windows. That's a, a car paint is an organic molecule today. Um, most of the dyes that you have in your clothing, as I look around here, those are all synthetic organic molecules that are making those colors. And colors, of course, mean that there are some very interesting optical properties. They have a lot of disadvantages, too. I don't want to get into it too much, but I just want to tell you that this is, people are working all the time on finding new ways to make inexpensive uh, solar energy generating equipment. And this is a, a really exciting area of physics, just to show you how one of these things work. Remember the silicon solar cell? It was about, let's say, a half a millimeter in thickness. In this case, uh, the organic solar cells are on the order of 100 nanometers, and this is my scaling factor. That's about five millionths of an inch thick. Um, I think a hair is about, a human hair is about uh, 10,000 times wider than that is thin, and yet it can be very, very efficient. You can see the photon comes down from the sun, it generates an electron and a positive charge called a hole uh, going swept to the various contacts and turns on the fan. And you have to, the, the challenge here is really a materials challenge. You have to scale these fingers that I've shown, this interdigitated nanostructure, down to about two nanometers by 10 nanometers. You can see where we've done that in the corner in the, in the electron microscope picture. And if you do that, hopefully you'll get cheap. So there's the silicon line. And the big hope is that with organics will be very cheap and this will be widely accepted as a technology. So with all that, um, this is where we are in the world of organics. The maize and blue dots are uh, from the University of Michigan. All the others are, um, 
our uh, competitors. And amorphous silicon, so a lot of you know about Unisolar, they were an amorphous silicon uh, solar cell uh, company, probably the, the, the most important one in the world until they went out of business because amorphous silicon is not competitive with crystalline silicon, um, but you can see the promise of organics is still going up, we hope. So <clears throat> with that as a backdrop, I want to tell you about how to actually use this stuff. So we work at the quantum level, at the nanometer scale level, but listen, there's not, no house in the world is going to be powered with nanometer sized solar cells, so we've got to build something real. And this has been a fun project. Um, it's been powering our house, uh, our second house, using solar energy. So I'm just going to walk you through how we did this. We have a second house that's off-grid in Vermont. Um, my wife, Roz, who's sitting in this audience, actually agreed to buy a house that was off-grid. But you can see it's quite a beautiful spot. And you can see where it is in Vermont. It's right in the center of the trapezoid we call Vermont, uh, up in the White Mountains, in a square cut out from the National Forest that's about an acre and a half aside. So first thing you got to do is you got to buy yourself a house. Sorry. Um, then you got to go shopping. Um, <laughs> New England is filled with small mom and pop stores that are solar energy stores and wind energy stores. Um, but that's not the real industry. This is just kind of fun. But we did a lot of work with, with um, uh, businesses like this. And then you got to get yourself some cheap labor. Um, the, the character on the left is my middle son, Aaron, who's an architect. And he was very important in helping to design the system. And uh, the guy on the right is, uh, is Tim Forrest. And he is, uh, he's a chef down in New Orleans. <coughs> so he was really uh, useful when we needed a beer. Uh, <laughs> and um, then, unf well, fortunately, my son married another architect, Yasmin Vogus. And you can see what they kind of got into were long discussions and no power. So um, <laughs> that was one of the panels that we, we bought. This is sitting in our garage. And then, of course, you have to find more cheap labor to haul the stuff 40 feet up onto your roof. Um, and you can see the sort of project that we were involved in. Those, those hands up there were my son. My daughter absolutely refused to get up on the roof, so she doesn't appear in this. And it, it's pretty scary because um, you, well, you kind of saw the front picture of the house. It goes down about, uh, it goes down a long ways. But we, we got them up there, and that's how it looks. And we, we have a, um, a caretaker to our house, a 75-year-old Vermonter, and he, he always has uh, things to say. <laughs> uh, so he, he, was <laughs> he was telling the townspeople that uh, Steve put his panels on the roof so they would be closer to the sun. Um, <laughs> the, other, the other thing he said after that, of course, is don't he know that the sun shines just as bright on the ground? <laughs> <laughs> the, the problem with this, of course, is it snows up there. And this was something that we had um, not entirely anticipated. We thought we had, we had dealt with that issue, but we obviously didn't. Um, and we can tilt these at two different angles for summer and winter. We change them during the solstices. Now, it was very important because uh, my wife, Roz, lives up there some time by herself um, that we had a totally automated system rather than having to go out and wait, wait for the batteries to go down and go out with an ohm meter and check to see if the batteries were too low and you have to um, maybe turn on a generator as a backup. Uh, so we made it completely automatic. Um, and there's a little, that little oval there actually controls, it looks at the battery voltage. And if the batteries go down too low, uh, it will turn on a backup generator, which you don't even know exists. And then in the garage, there's the brains. That's the balance of systems cost. <coughs> um, there's the, the black thing. Um, the black thing coming down uh, changes the DC into AC, so it's compatible with all of our, uh, all the stuff that we have in the house. And uh, we wired all that up ourselves. Um, there's our batteries. It gets really cold out there. That was what, see, I, we learned a lot of things. 
So we, <laughs> we built uh, a box around it. So one of the things you learn about lead acid batteries, which is really the only thing you can buy these days with any reasonable cost, is um, that as, of course, the charge goes down, and let's say they start out at 13 or 14 volts, and they, the voltage drops down, they become less and less acidic, and if it's really cold, they freeze. Um, and uh, that happened one year, so we, we put an a, a, uh, insulating box around it. It's really nasty when batteries freeze. They sure don't generate any power, and you can, it can crack all the plates, and you've lost a huge investment. Um, and so we always keep a small quiescent load on the house so that they're always generating a little power, even in the depths of winter, because it gets to minus 20 degrees up there quite regularly. And then right next to it, we have a propane generator in case the sun hasn't come out for a few days, um, which is very common, um, that will kick in when the battery voltage goes low and it'll charge the batteries itself. And then, of course, you switch on the lights. So that's, that's our house in the fall. And with all the lights on, it's a no-no. I, I've really, one thing we have learned how to do is conserve energy. You'll see that in a minute. Um, but, you know, we have to train everybody. If you leave, leave a room, you turn out the lights. But it's a beautiful spot, and it's very quiet because solar energy doesn't generate noise. And you can see the panels up there. There's about a kilowatt up there. So just to give you some system information on that, um, we have about a one kilowatt peak generating capacity. So on a good summer day, um, we get about five kilowatt hours is the total energy we get from that. Now, if you look at this is what's called an, uh, an insulation map of the US, and that's the November, because I figured we're close enough to November to use that. You'll see probably the worst places in the world to do solar is Michigan <laughs> and Vermont. <laughs> And if you're really nutty, go out to the Puget Sound, you know, going to the peninsula. But we're, we're in a bad spot for solar. Um, but, and there you can see in November, we're getting something like three to four kilowatt hours per day. So this is, this is a very efficient system we've got working. If I were to put this on regular electricity terms, that means we're generating about $1.50 of electricity per day. Total system cost, oh. An average American house, 25 kilowatt hours per day. It depends. If you live in Tennessee, it's more than if you live somewhere else because of heating and so on. Um, but that's, you know, I kind of pulled it off the web. And it, uh, Department of Energy uh, numbers, 25 kilowatt hours per day is about right. So you look at that and you say, oh my gosh, this guy is really crazy. He's only generating uh, one fifth of his total energy demand. Well, I don't have an average American house, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, total system cost to install, about $7,000, all retail. You can do better today. So the payback time is about 15 years. Um, actually, the payback time is instantaneous because without it, we don't have a whole lot of power. Um, <laughs> <laughs> things we power with electricity. So this is where we're very careful, and every appliance we buy is very clearly chosen for its energy conservation properties. We do have the internet. This is not a place that has outdoor plumbing and, you know. So we, this is a, a real home. Um, it's about 2,000 square feet. Uh, it has satellite internet, satellite TV, has a washer, a dryer, a dishwasher, microwave, toaster, coffee. Even if people are being a little bit uh, insensitive to the natural surroundings, they might turn on a hair dryer. Um, and our water system works on this. But what doesn't work on it? The refrigerator, the biggest energy drain in your house. So we've taken that off. And we use propane for our refrigerator, just expanding gas. Um, and we use room heat. Um, when we're not using wood, we're using uh, propane again, and the water heater. So if you want to do this yourself, here's some lessons learned. Putting panels closer to the sun is a really bad idea if it snows. So I keep telling my wife that I'm going to put them down in the garden eventually, but it seems like a lot of work. Um, automating everything is a great idea. So that's this, this automated uh, generator kick-in thing. Um, we do a lot of our heavy duty, for example, the dishwasher, which takes a lot of energy. We like to do that around midday, because that's when the sun is really pouring down on things, and I don't have to worry about charging up the batteries or running off the batteries. 
Um, it helps if you have a PhD in physics. Uh, if you're going to do this all by yourself, I can spend hours talking about the deals we've had to do with the various solar places around. And you know, you tell them, well, you know, I remember my wife was up there, and, and we had a problem on on one of the um, pieces of electronics, and I called the big place in Whitewater Junction um, and said, you know, we've got a problem. I've got to leave in the day. My wife is going to be up here. Not a problem. We'll come up and fix it. Not a problem. I says, uh, when can you book, book us in? Oh, about three months. Uh, and they're very busy. I mean, it's really true. Um, I think the next bullet is really important. There are so many mistakes to make. Be patient. Eventually, you'll get to all of them. Uh, <laughs> We certainly have. Um, keep the batteries warm in winter. Uh, it's very difficult to reduce. Uh, I mean, our carbon footprint is not insubstantial. Uh, we're certainly not a carbon neutral house by any stretch of the imagination. I don't believe you can possibly do that economically. Um, but uh, I'd love to have wind, but we've looked at that. And for what we want to do, it's about $30,000. So that's not going to happen. Um, use high voltage battery, pray for sun, and then conserve. So this will take me to the last section of my talk. Can we save the planet? Or can solar save the planet? Not by itself, but it can help. And this is the real message. So can you. So power generation is very important. Going off renewables is extremely critical, I believe, for the long-term health of the planet and for energy security and economic reasons all across the board. But there's a lot of things we can do before that, and conservation is the biggie. So I'll take just like three minutes to do this, and maybe we could have some questions. So conservation is the lowest hanging fruit. And if you look at, this is a Department of Energy uh, pie chart for how we use electricity. 24%, um, it's actually higher in some states, and I believe it's higher in, in general now. This was 2009. 25% of our electricity use goes into just turning on the lights. And we have really bad lighting sources. 80% of our lighting is incandescence. Incandescence is those light bulbs were invented by that same guy, Thomas Edison, way back when. Um, they're not going to improve anymore. They're about 5% efficient. They give off 95% heat, 5% light, because they are, in fact, a heater that gives off light as a byproduct. And so you need a lot of cooling in your buildings as well. So part of that 17% in space cooling just goes to cool the building because the lights are on. So it's about 30% of all electricity use. Can you imagine? I mean, we have all kinds of technologies today. Um, can you imagine just changing the efficiency of your light bulb <coughs> use, or turning them off, for goodness sakes, but just changing the efficiency with known technology today by a couple percent. It would completely change the number of coal burning plants we'd have to install. Um, it would save on your electricity bill. And if you use other sources of lights, um, you will uh, uh, have a very good economic balance to that. Even though you pay a little bit more upfront for these other lighting sources, the uh, cost of ownership is way down because the energy use is way down. Um, Ann Arbor actually was a leader in installing uh, light emitting diodes um, as lighting sources uh, in this city. Uh, now a lot of cities have caught up. It seemed kind of crazy. You know, we're kind of a, a hippie city. And so, of course, somebody in City Hall is going to say we ought to have LED lights so we'll all feel be better and sing kumbaya. But um, in fact, it turned out to be a pretty good economic proposition. You never change them. So for example, these, the light signals that you see now almost entirely being taken over by LEDs around the country and around the world is because it takes so much time and expense to, to take a light signal's incandescent bulb, which blows out every month or so, get a guy up on a ladder, he has to unscrew it, and then put in another bulb. Um, LEDs last for about 10 years in that domain. And here you can see them. We, had 50, we have something like 1,500 uh, light fixtures up by the last count that I knew of. It's probably more now. Um, but it, it actually saves quite a bit of money in the long term. Um, 
again, I like organic materials. They're super cheap. Um, and uh, we've been working hard on what are called organic light emitting diodes. Again, they're not those millimeters thick, but they're, uh, they're tenths or hundreds or thousands of millimeters thick. And you just take two organic materials. Again, you can sort of see their structural diagrams at the bottom. You, you put them in a little bilayer structure, and out comes light, and it's super efficient. And I'll show you that um, in a minute. Now, OLEDs are probably things that you have heard about because they're becoming, very ubi they're becoming ubiquitous um, in displays. So if you have a Galaxy display, how many people here have a Galaxy dis uh, cell phone? Uh, there's a few. They're actually the biggest selling cell phones in the world. Uh, they, they, outstrip the, um, they outstrip iPhones by quite a bit. Um, and uh, the, the Galaxy tabs, the Droid phones, they have OLED displays in them. Very efficient, very beautiful colors. You can also make TVs on them. This is an ancient TV up above. I actually have one in my house. Um, it's only 13 inches uh, across, and it cost, um, when they were building them, they don't build them anymore. Sony started out $2,500 for a little 13-inch TV. But you know, I'm an early adopter. And anybody here who's an early technology adopter, I want to say right out, right this very minute, I love you. Um, <laughs> because that's how we start industries. But uh, LG and Samsung are coming out with 55-inch displays. Right now, they're pretty expensive. 8500s, that's for you early adopters. Please go out and run buy some. Because <laughs> what'll happen is, you know, you, first a couple people buy them and then it's more, and these guys learn how to make them cheaper and cheaper, and before you know it, they're $1,000. But this is the display world. You can use those same light sources for, not for multicolor, but for white. And they make beautiful white colors. This, um, the stuff on the right is from Acuity Lighting. Um, you can buy it, it's really expensive. Um, because it's, it's what architects love today. Again, architects are early adopters because these, while they're very um, beautiful light sources, they're still too expensive to be a, a commodity like a light bulb that you can screw in. But if you're building a house, you'd want to do this perhaps. You can see they have these origami type of things on the lower right, flexible devices on the left. This is Universal Display Corporation, UDC, and GE, uh, Koenig and Minolta are coming up with these design things. What's really interesting is um, Philips has some really beautiful um, OLED chandeliers. And I would venture to guess they're going to be appearing in a lot of places. Of course, that's very high end, so they get good margins. And they can start to work the price down. Now, actually, I got this out of order. So I might go here first and come back to it. Just to show you what we're talking about when we're talking about conservation. Um, the efficacy of the light bulb is basically its efficiency. Incandescent bulbs, if you buy an incandescent bulb in the, in the grocery store, it's about 15 to 17 lumens per watt. What that means, lumens is a, um, is a perceptual brightness metric. So if you have a 100 watt bulb, it's about 1,500 lumens of light. Uh, so that, that's really... Uh, a very good uh, uh, metric to look at. Now, it actually costs, an incandescent bulb costs about 50 cents per kilolumen in the store. A thousand lumens, which is about a 60 watt bulb, costs you about 50 cents. You can go to miniature fluorescence. Now, of course, the first thing I did when we put in our solar system in Vermont is we took out all the incandescent bulbs in the house. It's a 2,000 square foot house. We took out at least 150 incandescent bulbs. That's what you've got in your house. They're everywhere. They, if you leave them in the dark, they multiply. <laughs> and I had boxes of these things. We had some roofers come out, which was a, a hilarious thing to begin with. If you noticed in the early photographs, the roof was different than the, the last photograph that I showed. Um, we had some really good Vermont roofers who came up to put on the new roof. And uh, after the first day, one guy fell off the roof. Roofers are not supposed to do that. So then they went on a break. Um, <laughs> then the next guy they brought out had uh, only one leg. Uh, <laughs> and he, he was not, he was never in a good mood. And uh, then the third guy they got out, I had to get up there and we had to work on the panels together. And this one guy sort of tiptoeing around. And I says, 
what's wrong with this guy? And the guy says, he's afraid of heights. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we got it done. But they really, they saw in my garage these piles of incandescent bulbs, and they said, can we have them? And I said, yeah, of course, go take them. So, but they're 50 cents per kilolumen. We replaced everything with miniature fluorescence, compact fluorescence. They're, um, well, five times, actually, probably when you finally get done with it, about four times more efficient than incandescence. They cost probably on the order of a dollar per kilolumen, not bad. Um, you can see all these other things that happen. <coughs> then you get to LEDs, um, which is what you can now buy for exorbitant prices in uh, Home Depot and places like that. They're really brilliant light sources. They're wonderful. Um, they're about 100 lumens per, uh, per watt. The best things in the labs are about 240 lumens per watt. You can imagine how much energy you can save. Unfortunately, they're about $10 per kilolumen. The Department of Energy feels that when they get to about $5 routinely, these will be broadly adopted. And then OLEDs, which is the world that I work in, is really, I think, the, the most pleasing of all the light sources. They're, they're pretty high efficiency. <coughs> they, they could certainly get up to, um, to about uh, 200 uh, lumens per watt. Um, but they're right now about $1,000 per kilolumen. So there's a lot of stuff we have to do before you can get the price down. Uh, this just shows, um, this is a, uh, an industry view graph that shows how OLEDs are moving toward um, the DOE, the Department of Energy target of 2015 of around 150 lumens per watt, which is not going to be hard to, to meet. And you can see the progress has been really quite robust. So why organics? Why all of this stuff? Look, in the end, a light source and a solar panel have a lot of things in common. They have to be really cheap for people to use them. Um, they have to be large area because you're capturing lots of sunlight or you're creating lots of room light. So you, rather than making these things one at a time as, or, in, or in small batches on wafers, the way we do semiconductors, the hope here is to be able to make electronics like you make newspapers, or like we used to make newspapers, which is on a printing press, and just roll it out and make our electronics by the mile rather than by the inch. And that's the promise of organics on very thin plastic or metal foils, like uh, the metal foils we have in our kitchens. Um, it's really cheap stuff, and we really change the entire economic proposition uh, for, these, for these technologies and get them injected uh, into the marketplace much sooner. So in terms of you know, what's happening to the world, I guess my, I'm an internal optimist, so I always start off by saying the sky is falling, but. Right? And the but is there are numerous solutions to our en energy problems today. There's tons of technology out there. It's a matter of getting it. Uh, used and getting it cheap. A climate change and energy security make our search for these solutions imperative and urgent, in my view. But no matter what technology we choose, it's getting people to use it that's so important. Um, and that's why I love early adopters, uh, sort of warming up to this. Policy, behavior, why do people buy big cars that use a lot of energy when they could buy a smaller car um, that has all the same features and sometimes better and costs less. We, those are hard, hard questions to, to address. And of course, there's always vested interest, which is there are incumbent technologies and companies that are out there that will do everything they can in government, on the street, to you, to make sure you don't adopt the other technology, even though it might be a much better proposition for you because they don't want to be displaced. And so those are the real showstoppers. With that, I will give my thanks to the people who have funded our work. The US Department of Energy has been a really sound partner in everything that we're doing, both lighting and uh, uh, solar. The US Department of Defense, they're always trying to find ways to make things more lightweight and more mobile. Uh, we work with a couple companies, Global Photonic Energy Corporation. These are wonderful names because it's like they're in the center of the universe, Global Photonics. Um, and a Universal Display Corporation, so that's the solar cell and the uh, display company we work with. Solar Wind, a little company, mom and pop, in Rutland, Vermont, who's given me lots of advice. 
uh, Aaron and Tim Forrest and Yasmin Vobis, the architects and the cook, for supplying um, good ideas throughout. And of course, my wife Rosamond, who was brave enough to get a house in Vermont with no obvious way to power it, and who still wouldn't mind having grid electricity as backup. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs> Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.